and welcome to City Connection. This is the live call-in show with uh, Grand Rapids Mayor Rosalind Bliss, and we're welcoming you to the April 2021 edition. Uh, along with Mayor, I'm your host, Linda Galash, Community Media Center's representative in this uh, co-produced show. And we'll be welcoming the mayor right here in a second, but also want to mention to you that we have the new CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Rapid, that's Deborah Prado. She's in her first month in the new position, but we'll be learning a little bit about here shortly uh, in the lead role, a little bit about uh, taking her uh, position as uh, transformation in a world of public transportation is kind of happening right now. Uh, Mayor, this is new for us. We're um, in the studio together. Yeah. We've been separate for more than a year of City Connection, so we look forward to kind of doing this in the more uh, upper personal version of this. We also have Deborah Prado in the uh, waiting room coming on studio shortly. Um, just want to let you know that you can take part in the conversation as well. We have an opportunity for your comments at cityconnection at grcmc.org. That's uh, email, Twitter is at GRTV Access, and uh, you can also comment on D GRTV's Facebook page. Uh, welcome, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be back in the studio with you. It yeah. is, uh, it's nice to get out from in front of the Zoom camera. I'm sure everyone is looking forward to that. And Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm really delighted that we have Deborah joining us. I, as you know, I serve on the board of the Rapid, and mm -hmm. I was on the subcommittee that worked through the hiring process. And so we're excited to find such a stellar candidate and to have Deborah join our community and lead the Rapid, as you said, through really a period of transformation as we think about the future of mobility, uh, especially coming out of the pandemic. Absolutely. And yeah. then maybe we can talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, this was a diligent extensive search and uh, yeah. what you saw in um, Deborah Prado in terms of uh, this is the right person for the right time. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about all things Grand Rapids and uh, just kind of cover a few things that uh, in a general sort of way. Okay. Um, new announcement came out of the city having to do with uh, maybe a bit of a response to the call for uh, policing reforms, but it's neighborhood policing and yeah. um, an aspect of it that includes helicopters. So tell us a little bit about all that. Yeah, so um, so I would say that those two are, are pretty separate, I would okay. say. Um, so the neighborhood policing piece is a piece um, related to the strategic plan, and actually the chief started implementing that a couple weeks ago, really identifying ways to get more uh, uniform officers out into the neighborhood. So historically we always had kind of a smaller group within the Department of Community Police Officers, and this kind of transforms that and takes it away from just a small group of individuals as part of a community policing effort to really say all of all of our officers need to be neighborhood policing officers and so identifying uh, really looking at the city as a whole identifying officers to get out into neighborhoods build relationships and do more proactive policing uh, and I would say that's separate from uh, a couple initiatives that the chief wants to do each year around operation safe neighborhood so that's something that he started last year when we saw an uptick of violence in the community. Uh, and what that entailed was increasing the presence of officers out in the neighborhoods for a brief period of time to address not just some of the current issues, but also uh, some of the, some do a little bit more proactive policing as well. So it entails the Operation Safe Neighborhoods entails going out a couple days in advance, talking to neighborhoods. Um, residents in neighborhoods letting them know that we're going to have a greater police presence that will be really following up on a number of uh, issues or concerns brought to our attention through vice or SWAT or other departments and then doing a more intensive over the weekend presence uh, in neighborhoods and so that's this recent probably about a week and a half ago was it, it wasn't this last Friday it was Friday before uh, that was Operation Safe Neighborhood, and one night uh, the Michigan State Police assisted with uh, their helicopters. So. so tell a little bit about the strategy of uh, that more intensity and helicopters, yeah. even in light of um, calls for defunding. Yeah, so the, you know, the chief um, shared with us, I, I received some of the concerns as well in my office. It was actually a um, pretty mixed response I received from residents. And, you know, the chief's argument is that there are times when we need, as he calls, eyes in the sky. So we've had complaints, particularly over the last year, around motorcycles speeding, uh, not just downtown, but in some of the neighborhoods, as well as when there are um, any types of chases. It's helpful to have 
eyes in the sky, as they say, to help with response to those incidents. Uh, and I think that is really what he was hoping to do, is just have that additional support uh, as they did, as they implemented Operation Safe Neighborhood. Okay. Trying to get ahead of, I mean, his, his, you know, what he, he followed up with city commissioners because um, myself and a number of commissioners asked for additional information. Uh, and, you know, like any chief, uh, throughout the country when you see a, a pretty significant uptick in crime like we saw last year not just with gun violence but with homicides uh, how do we be more proactive and try to prevent that from happening again this year uh, and this was one of the one of the efforts I would say trying to get ahead of that this year to prevent something similar from last year with the number of violent crimes that we saw. And is this right now, because as seasons change, there's uh, more outdoor activities going on? What's yeah. the timing is my yeah. question. Yeah, I think that was the, again, I'm not a part of those um, strategic decisions within the department. I mean, this, this is a strategy that was uh, created within the police department and with the chief at the helm. Uh, and I don't, I wasn't a part of those. I can assume that that's part of it is that we are seeing more people outside, the weather is changing, uh, you know, there are some, we've seen an increase in uh, vehicles that have been stolen and used in thefts. So I think part of it, it was probably a culmination of that is my guess, um, but I don't want to speak for the chief on timing wise and why it was decided that weekend versus another time. Sure. And yeah. Last question on this. Yeah. Before yeah. We no, move it's on. a good. It's a great question. It's just you said you had, you'd gotten calls about concerns with the announcement. Now that it's happened a time, uh, or so, it, what have you heard? What's yeah, again, I've I've heard mixed feedback. Some people were were um, extremely unha extremely unhappy with it, uh, as you said it, it especially people who want to see less of a police presence. Um, they adamantly disagreed with the tactic, while other people, uh, they really don't want to see the kind of violence that they saw in their neighborhood last year. And, you know, they're, they're, they, in, they appreciate seeing more of a police presence. Uh, so I think, it, I think it depends on the individual. Uh, and I think it's very similar to the feedback that we received through the flash vote. Um, we saw a mix. We saw mm -hmm. some people who wanted more funding for police, our police department. Some people wanted more police presence in their neighborhood, while others said that it was sufficient as is, and then others said that they would like to see less. Um, okay. So I think it really depends on the individual in the neighborhood and their past experience with um, with the police, quite frankly. Okay. Well, yeah. I appreciate all, uh, entertaining all those questions. Yeah, no, they're good questions. And, it's, mm -hmm. and you know, we continue to, to wrestle with issues around policing and finding that balance to make sure that we have adequate support to respond when we need to respond, but also recognizing that we really want to shift our philosophy and shift our tactics, particularly mm -hmm. around calls that don't necessarily need a police response. We've talked at length about how do we not just build up our homeless outreach team, but how do we build up behavioral and mental health so that we're responding to calls where somebody is having a mental health crisis or a substance use crisis, how do we respond differently to those calls? Uh, and we're in the, in the midst of, of hopefully building that team up and building those services up. Um, at the same time, we're looking at implementation of cure violence and how do we, you know, how do we have an evidence-based violence prevention program that really can focus on prevention and more proactive type of relationship building. Um, so again, it's not, it's not an easy answer when it comes to public safety. Um, and we're trying, a, a, I would say, a multi-pronged approach. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we did mention spring, and maybe we can go in a little more positive direction. Uh, spring break this week, and yeah. we do kind of feel a little bit of a, a change in the weather. But are we bracing for uh, what follows spring break with uh, potential uh, COVID rates and that sort of thing? Just give us an update yeah. on, um, is the city preparing for that? I did see an announcement that the city will continue to do virtual meetings at least into June, maybe through the end of June. What are the thoughts yeah. there? Yeah, so we're um, we're really following some of the guidelines that we're seeing come from Lansing. Uh, the city commission, we did decide to go ahead and continue to meet virtually through the end of June. We're hopeful that by then we'll see a higher percentage of our community who've received the vaccinations. Uh, the vaccine clinic is very busy. In fact, downtown if you've been down there today, you'll see a, a constant stream of people coming in and out getting their uh, their shots, their vaccine shots. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think we're in a, a really precarious time. We're seeing an increase in positivity rates. 
Um, however, we're not seeing a similar increase in deaths, which is good. Uh, but we also know that uh, everyone, not everyone, but that the, the breadth of, of symptoms that people experience related to COVID is, is very broad. So mm -hmm. some people, uh, they have little to no symptoms and some people have really serious symptoms. And so we don't want anyone to get COVID. Unfortunately, right now we're seeing higher numbers than we've seen in months. Uh, but with that said, we know that the population most at risk, lar largely they've received um, their vaccinations, which is great, prevents severe symptoms. So it's kind of in, the, in this precarious place. We're seeing increase in hospitalizations, uh, ho however, not the severity of cases that we saw before, increase in positivity, but also an increase in vaccines. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a race against the clock to try to get to that herd immunity, which is closer to you know, 75, 80%. Uh, people vaccinated right now, we're hovering around 25%. So we know we have some work to do. It's gonna take at least, you know, probably four to six weeks, depending on the number of doses that we get uh, to get to that herd immunity. And, and so it's just a matter of, of timing. Uh, I'm very concerned about spring break and uh, I know the governor is as well. And, you know, we may see a little bit of a dip this week and then an uptick next week. Um, I'm hopeful that's not the case, that people are taking good precautions. Uh, but we shall see. I mean, the, the, the reality of this past year is that um, you hope for the best and you try to plan for the worst and, uh, mm -hmm. and it's just a lot of unknowns. And another factor, and being no epi epidemiologist of my own, but another factor is the spread of the variant, which yeah. would uh, be a game changer, possibly. Yeah. So we, we know what we know for sure about the variant is that it's it spreads here. more quickly. Um, not necessarily that the reactions or the symptoms are worse. Uh, and so we do believe that the fact that we are seeing variant cases in the state of Michigan, we do think that that's in, at least impacting the current increase that we're seeing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, appreciate the information on that and, and just how the city is kind of observing and seeing that. I uh, wanted to step into an area of um, the parks and uh, parks and uh, facilities here where there's now going to be free Wi-Fi. Yes. In 10 different parks here in Grand Rapids. Yeah, so this is actually an effort that we started last year in partnership with um, Kent County. So Kent mm -hmm. County used some of their CARES money um, to purchase the equipment, uh, initial equipment to allow for uh, cities, townships, uh, villages to identify if they wanted to partner with the county to provide free Wi-Fi or hotspots in different public spaces. And so we embarked on that with the county. They assisted in purchasing the equipment and now we will continue to pay for the service. And so we do have a list of parks uh, where you can go and have access to free Wi-Fi. Uh, it's not the it's not the full answer to the problem when it comes to access to broadband and Wi-Fi, uh, but it's a step in the right direction, as I would say. You know, people can go and utilize that service, uh, and hopefully, we've had we have them spread out throughout the community um, well enough that, regardless of what neighborhood you live in, you can get access to one of those. It, a little bit similar, like the libraries have been allowing their Wi-Fi yes. to be used during these times of closing, so yeah. that people can connect. Yeah, yeah. The, the library has been helpful as well. Okay. Yeah. Good to know about that. And then another thing, a couple other aspects that I guess you could put under environmental type things, but the city's Lake Michigan filtration plant is uh, embarking on a solar project. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'll talk about a couple environmental uh, projects that we've been working on that are starting to come, come to fruition. So we've been uh, working at length to try to analyze the feasibility and financial uh, feasibility of adding solar. So we've actually looked and analyzed um, the probability and possibility of adding solar to the Butterworth landfill, the water, the wastewater treatment facility, Lake Michigan filtration plant out on uh, Lake Michigan. And uh, the numbers came back. It turns out to be about a 15 to 17 year ROI on that. And it will help us to increase our percentage of renewable energy that we use at the city. Uh, so we had to go through a pretty lengthy process to get approval from, uh, oh. from the township out there. But uh, we just recently got the green light. And so we'll be moving forward in par partnership with CMS to add a solar array out at the Lake Michigan filtration plant. So that's very exciting. Um, we also move forward on converting our street lights to LED. Uh, again, lots of people have asked me questions yeah. about the 4,000 watt versus 3,000 and white light versus yellow. And yeah. we've tried to be as, uh, as 
uh, responsive as possible, but that will save us uh, about $350,000 a year in energy costs, and obviously you use less energy with LED. Um, and then we'll be opening up the biodigester soon, so just in a couple months, uh, and that's that will create renewable natural gas here in our city uh, from waste that we collect, which is great. And then also uh, this spring, we're opening up the brand new composting site out at Butterworth. So some big projects uh, will we'll open up this year that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Great news on all of those. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy to see all of them move forward. All right, well, yeah. let's take our first break now. We'll be back after the break with the new CEO of The Rapid. It's Deborah Prado, back right after this. For over 30 years after humble beginnings as a public access TV station, the Community Media Center has grown to be an active, multi-platform media and technology assistance organization, encouraging and enabling our community to push the creative boundaries. We power a variety of resources including a music-centered community radio station, WYCE, a community venue with stage and screen at Wealthy Theater citizen-driven journalism with the Rapidian, a web development team empowering local nonprofits, an education department that trains and broadens students' minds, and a free speech public access television studio, GRTV, where it all began. By introducing audiences to new voices and ideas, we enhance community engagement and create connections between artists and audiences, enriching our city's cultural offerings. We empower and collaborate with platforms and resources accessible to all and used by all. Every free democratic society depends on media, accessible to the community and uncensored by government. The Community Media Center continues this work for the media landscape of today and tomorrow. These platforms and services empower our neighbors to tell their stories and explore the richness of culture that Grand Rapids has to offer. Connect, discover, learn, create, and share. The Grand Rapids Community Media Center. Welcome back. We're uh, delighted to have with us today, as Linda said earlier, uh, Deborah Prado. So Deborah joins us, uh, just recently moved to Grand Rapids from New York, uh, and joins us as our new CEO at The Rapid. Uh, Deborah has a wealth of experience that I'll ask her to share uh, uh, in, the, in the world of transit. <laughs> Uh, and we are really excited to have her. I serve on the board of the Rapid. Um, if you're not familiar with the Rapid, it is a multi-jurisdictional um, authority. So it's not just the city of Grand Rapids, but it's actually the all six cities. So that includes Kentwood and Wyoming, Granville, uh, Walker, East Grand Rapids, and the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, on the board, each city has a number of um, spots on the board or seats on the board based on population. So it truly is a multi-jurisdictional authority. Uh, I know sometimes people will, will call me and they'll want me to do something at the Rapid and I have to remind them that um, it's, it's not seen, overseen <laughs> just by the city of Grand Rapids. We have a voice at the table, but we don't necessarily lead the table. It truly is a, a partnership. 
Uh, and so with that, uh, when we needed to identify and hire a new CEO, I had the pleasure to serve with a number of other mayors on a search committee. Uh, we hired a national consultant that uh, went out and brought forward a really incredible, diverse slate of candidates, Deborah being one of those candidates. And I participated in a round of interviews and then she was interviewed by the full board uh, and offered a position a couple months ago and joined, joined us. Uh, are you on your third week now? No, fourth. Fourth week. Ooh, so, I'm an old so, timer. <laughs> so joined us four weeks ago uh, up and moved here to Grand Rapids. So hopefully if you get a chance to meet her, you can welcome her uh, to our city. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is just give Deborah a chance to share a little bit about her experience, why she wanted to come to Grand Rapids and the, the opportunity that she saw with the Rapid. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the really exciting uh, work that's happening at the Rapid right now, um, even despite, I would say, the pandemic and mm -hmm. a reduction in ridership. There's a lot of good work happening right now with our recent COA, so we can talk about that as well. Okay. Um, right. So with that, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so for folks who, who don't know much about you, do you want to share a little bit about your yeah. experience? Um, and yeah, so most recently at the MTA in New York City, um, Chief People, uh, business transformation for New York City Transit. So the MTA is uh, a family. So two railroads, Long Island Railroad and Metro North, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, um, New York City Transit and MTA Boston. And then there's a headquarters group that is largely the support team and capital construction. Um, I was there for almost three years. Um, before that at uh, New Jersey Transit, um, not my first foray into transit. Um, I really cut my teeth in Rochester, New York. Um, I was with the county government for 20 years. The opportunity came there to um, meet with a new CEO. The mission was compelling. It was upside down. We needed to, you know, turn over every leaf and tear down every wall, and that's what we did. And I think that experience really allowed me to learn transit inside out. I was their head of labor relations, went through some tough negotiations and some good negotiations, um, but ended up really learning a lot about the business. And yeah. so I'm a self-described transit geek. Yeah, <laughs> which, is, which is wonderful. You also come <coughs> from a, a family that is dedicated to public service. I know yeah. you talked about that a bit so. during the interview. I'm really fortunate, I, and, and I, I said this in a letter to the team, that I do think it's um, one of the strongest strands of my DNA. Um, when my children were small, I have triplets, so I didn't have much time to do anything other than take care of them, but I do yeah. think that public sector work is always building the community that you work in, the community that you live in, the community you're part of, and so I've always felt fortunate to, to be in that position in that role. Um, yeah. I tried private sector for a little bit. It's not for me. Yes. Yeah. I've got a public sector heart. Yeah. Well, we're glad to have you. So, you. Um, so you come to the Rapid with some great experience. Uh, also at a, I would say a, a, a pretty pivotal time. Um, you know, the transit systems all over this country really um, with the pandemic saw a massive mm -hmm. reduction in ridership. At the same time, people are thinking differently about the future of transit and, you know, how do you incorporate mobility on demand and other modes of public transit into mm -hmm. a system that's more holistic. So even before you came, um, the board had embarked probably about a year ago, uh, maybe a little over a year ago, we started the process of a COA, which stands for Complete Organizational Assessment, uh, really looking at our current system, identifying what's working well, what should be changed, how do we really prepare for the future of transit and maybe even change a little bit based on what the community needs are. Um, so we've been working on that process for several months and then you come in, we're kind of finishing up the process yeah. and now it's gonna fall to you to implement whatever uh, we decide to move forward with, which I should say the board voted on at our last board meeting to um, accept and approve the COA uh, recommendations. So do you wanna talk a little bit about that? And it's a, it's a big plan, right? Yeah. So it's um, a planning document that will be our blueprint for where we go in the future, how we think about transit. Um, being a little bit more um, centric on a mobility network that although we have fixed route service, there are different things that we can do. Um, Microtransit 
uh, fits into the scooters. Yeah. Uh, every, everything fits into the, the blueprint. Um, now it'll be doing a lot of work. I do have to say the team has done a tremendous amount of work on this whole entire program. Uh, the public input process has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, one silver lining of the, um, the pandemic was more people were comfortable in a virtual setting and we got much more participation from the public than we've ever had before. Yeah. Um, that will continue. Um, this is just the beginning, so we're on page one. Um, so the board's given us the ability to move forward with it, and now we'll be doing more data analysis. How do we use that? What are our headways? I think the most immediate things you'll see are um, shorter headways on the most populous routes um, so that you can stand out at um, you know, a shelter or a bus stop and know that in 15 minutes a bus is going to come. You won't need to look at your phone or a timetable or anything like that. So that'll be one of the first improvements. And then in Kentwood and Walker, looking at some um, uh, on-demand service, which will be totally new for us <laughs> and really exciting um, but it needs a lot of a lot of groundwork um, yeah. done and the team's hard working at that right now yeah and for people who um, are excited about that uh, as an option uh, my understanding is that it'll it'll involve smaller vehicles yes uh, and it'll cover a certain geographic area and the hope is that it will really be uh, uh, around uh, clusters for jobs so job mm -hmm. clusters so um, where you find where you, where there's a lot of employment uh, where you have a number of companies so an industrial park or a number of companies where people thousands of people are going there every day uh, and we've heard from those employee employers that they want more options for public transit we'll start to really try to work within those those areas yeah, well, the key for any business is recruiting and retaining employees. Yeah. And they need them. And we're at a time where we're coming out of the pandemic. I think we're coming out of the pandemic. Knock um, on wood. Yeah, knock on wood. Um, I think we're coming out of the pandemic. Um, I keep talking to the team about, I think, like June 30th is going to be the new New Year's. Um, people will make some re new resolutions about what they're going to do. Um, once we get to herd immunity, there will be some things that open up. Um, $20 million question is, when do people come back to offices? Yeah. Do they come back to offices? How often do they come back to offices? Um, so, you know, every week we look at our ridership, see where it's going. Right now it's a little bit wonky to look at because we're at spring break and, you know, yeah. Easter break moves around and some of that's a little bit different. Um, but we're running about a third of where we were. Um, which isn't bad compared to national averages. We're running about the, the average. Um, I think it'll just be interesting to see how we come at this new reality with creative solutions. Yeah. And the on-demand is designed to get people to employment opportunities, and that just helps fuel the entire economy. Yeah, yeah, and I know some people have talked to me about this related to funds that were allocated to, um, for the cities. Uh, related to the relief package that was passed, but there's also funds within that package for transit uh, systems to make yep. sure that we're able to stay financially viable uh, through this pandemic and hopefully into the you know next couple years we'll be able to make sure that we are able to continue to provide service re regardless of the ridership at least as we hopefully build back up. Yeah, and thankfully, and I, and I think the Rapid has done a lot of the right things right. Um, they have a CNG fleet, um, working towards building more of the CNG fleet out. Um, I think we're working with the city on the renewable energy. Mm -hmm. um, those are all really good things that not everybody, not every organization was thinking about. So I think we're well positioned. Um, if, if we're not at the head of the race, we are close to the front of the starting line yeah. in terms of where we can go from here. And, and again, the super team there, um, everybody I've met has been so welcoming. Um, lots of information, um, lots of, I was saying, uh, lots of puzzle pieces to put together. It's not all crystal clear to me what the picture looks like yet, um, but in terms of spirit and community and caring, um, wouldn't want to be anyplace else. Yeah.
Yeah, well, we have just a couple minutes left before we take a break uh, and bring Linda in. We'll ask some more questions. Uh, you know, so for those of you not familiar with the CNG, it's compressed natural gas. Yes. Uh, and we'll be uh, using the renewable natural gas from the wastewater treatment facility that we create um, for some of our buses, which is really wonderful. Uh, and then, and then I'll just end by saying it's also an exciting time because you join us right after we uh, opened up the Laker line. So our second BRT line, a bus rapid transit line. Uh, so many of you are familiar with the silver line that was opened up several years ago. Um, we're, ho we're doing a, a division uh, united mm -hmm. plan right now to try to increase some of the development along uh, Division Street around those nodes where we have stops uh, for the Silver Line and then uh, we opened up the Laker Line which runs from downtown all the way out to Allendale with several stops along the way and you're already starting to see private investment around along that yes. route actually quite a bit especially in Standale and Walker. It's really um, exciting. Yeah so exciting times. I know lots of people ask me about uh, you know are we going to have a third line that goes north or further east uh, you know, we are always analyzing that and looking at opportunity. Uh, but as of right now, we'll get we'll get the Laker line uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well off the ground uh, through this this season of the pandemic, and then we'll see what what comes next for BRT. Yeah, so. uh, it, it's it's data driven and public input, right? Yep. Uh, we can't run a line if no one is going to ride it, but where there's demand, um, we certainly need to look at everything that we can do to make sure that. Uh, citizens are getting to where they want to go. Yeah. It's not about where we want to take them, it's about where they want to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great spot to end. Yeah. So we'll take a little break and then we'll come back with some questions for uh, Deborah and more questions about the Rapid. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. FM WYCE, a proud member of the Grand Rapids Community Media Center, has been serving the Grand Rapids community and beyond for over 30 years, offering a world of music through commercial-free, independent radio. Head on over to WYCE.org today, where you can stream our broadcast 24-7, check out exclusive artist interviews, or make a donation. From everyone at 88.1 FM WYCE, thank you for your support. The Wealthy Theatre is Grand Rapids' local movie theater and performance center. Since 1998, it has been a host to nationally touring music groups, local theater performances, and a variety of community events. Today, the Wealthy Theatre is not only a landmark community treasure with historic significance, but a pioneer in the infusion of technology and traditional theater. Underneath the elegance and classic sensibility that defines Wealthy Theatre, there is a matrix of new technologies. The theatre is completely digital and outfitted with cameras and microphones for concerts, theatre and comedy troupes, speakers and lecturers, and so much more. Experience all that Wealthy Theatre has to offer. And bring a friend. Be surprised by the Wealthy Theatre. Welcome back to City Connection. In studio with me and Mayor Bliss is uh, Deborah Prado of the Rapid, and we've learned quite a bit already, but we have a few community member questions. So we're gonna start right away with uh, uh, maybe one that the mayor can help with as well. It seems like it might predate you, but it says, why did the Rapid discontinue the 10 ride card? And between the two of you, what might be the answer yeah. to that one? Well, so Do it does predate me, um, but we went to a different type of fair media. And so going to the loadable 
Um, they mm -hmm. made some, they did a lot of analysis on it and what works and what doesn't. Um, I don't know all the driving factors into it, um, but certainly trying to make it a level playing ground as we as we transition over. Yeah, yeah, and I, I remember those um, conversations, and I think that's exactly right. Trying to streamline the process, but also changing the, the system that we changed. Uh, and then it, I would it, the person asking that question. I would encourage them if there's an issue that they're having with the new system to please reach out to the Rapid and to see if we can help solve that problem for them. Um, we've, tried, we've done a lot of education about, even before we changed over to the new system, we tried to make sure people who, especially who ride the rapid a lot, that they um, had a pretty seamless transition to the new system. So if somebody's having problems, I really encourage them just to reach out to us. Okay, so how about you tell us how do you pay for a fare on the rapid? How does this happen for maybe an occasional rider and then for a frequent one? Uh, so now you would purchase um, fare media that can be reloadable. So it's a, a, a value card mm -hmm. and um, you load it up with what you need and as you tap it's a uh, descending bell. Yeah. I'm trying to think the, the It's right like a word. QR code, right? Yeah. It, yeah. Or like a It'll just swipe right use your right. money down and yeah. then I think it's after two rides that you take it basically pays for itself the rest of that day so it's a pretty good deal in terms of that yeah. um, it's called the wave everyone knows it as a tap card but you really do just wave it in yeah. front of it and then um, you keep the card and you just keep reloading it with your with your fair media amounts okay. yeah yeah and, and it's a I would say it's a similar account if you have like city refuse so when we tip there's a code that's swiped and it comes directly out of your account and at least at the city level, it seems like that easiest way is through credit card, but what about the unbanked? Any issues mm -hmm. there in loading up a card? No, our information booth yeah. is still working with okay. customers to take their cash and load it on a card. Um, certainly we recognize that while we're turning into a more of a cashless society mm -hmm. on whole, there are folks who are, are not a available to do that, and so we've kept that option open. I think at some point we will be working on how do we close that down, and it probably will be TVMs on the, um, um, at the stops um, at the central station so that you'll be able to insert your cash and then get a loaded card. Okay. Does the Rapid, maybe the website, have tutorials and things like that about how to ride, mm -hmm. how to pay for cards, that sort of thing? And I think about, you know, we've talked a little bit before about uh, folks just coming out of the, um, uh, maybe out of prison, new re-entry situations where technology has passed them by, and just wondering about that. Yeah. That is a great question, and it's one that I've talked about with the comms team. Um, I'm a firm believer that adults don't necessarily like to ask questions. <laughs> and so if I can watch a YouTube video uh, four times from the privacy of my own home <laughs> or phone, I'm probably good, and we've talked about doing that. So if, if it doesn't exist, and I really don't know for sure if it does, um, that is something that we've talked about doing. Yeah, I, I know we did some of those videos, very brief videos, right when we switched over to the Wave uh, card. Um, I'm not sure if they're still on the website, but we, we can follow up on that. That's, yeah, a, that's absolutely. a great question. Mm -hmm. All right, and then just another curious question from uh, some a community member. Carl is asking, are all buses electric? And we did hear a little bit about uh, gas fueled, uh, natural gas fueled okay. ones from the biodigester possibilities there or, or something like that. No, not all are electric. No. Um, there's compressed natural, natural gas and diesel. And then we're looking at some no low emission electric buses also. Um, hopefully we'll be able to use some of the smaller buses and some of the pilots for electric. Yeah. So is that kind of the thinking between the kinds of fuel, the size of the vehicle, or do you want to transition towards something in particular? It's quite a mix. Um, so I think we've been settling towards CNG, um, but we want to look at the electric buses. We think that that could be a good solution in some of the on-demand zones. So we'll test that out. Um, we'll apply for some grants to do that and um, we'll see what we think. Um, certainly where we find success, we'll do more of. Okay. So the mayor was great in asking you questions a little bit about what brought you here, but I wanted to dig a, a little bit more. Grand Rapids particularly, we love to hear what people love about us, and I'm wondering what brought you here with this job choice for you. So it does feel like home. Um, so born and raised in Rochester, New York, 
It's not a Great Lake. It's not the. I know it's. They keep telling me at work it is not the best Great Lake. This is the best Great Lake. <laughs> We're um, very biased about Lake Michigan. Going to find out. Um, it's a good size. Um, it's a community that's growing, and you don't always see that. It's not stagnant. Um, I think it's a community of philanthropy, and I think where people are investing in their own community, where they live, those are all these really great signs of life, uh, great signs of hope. So in terms of kind of weighing out all the pieces in my calculus, um, those were ones that I heavily weighted. Okay. We had a, a great description on how uh, public transportation transit is so critical to growth in an area. And um, just wanted to see with some of the plans on the horizon for the rapid, the things that are moving ahead, what kind of um, growth potential do you think that brings just on its own? So I think the on-demand is going to bring us a lot of growth because I think we're really going to uncover some unknown travel patterns. Um, that we have no way of getting da data on right now. So we'll start mining the data on where people want to go, what's the point of origin, what's the point of destination, mm -hmm. and then how do we fi move that to a fixed route. Um, I think we want to expand some more on the BRTs. I think there's more we could do there. Um, we're looking at how do we facilitate a network how are we really great partners in transportation with the city and others that provide transportation so that we close those gaps? Um, I think that as we look at post-pandemic, I think it's going to be totally different than everything mm -hmm. we've ever known. And um, while nobody has a crystal ball, um, we want to be on top of that. And so we're looking at like what are other big cities doing? What are other small cities doing? What are other people thinking? And the public input will be key. I would like to become a customer-led um, you know, organization where our customers tell us what they're interested in and we figure out how we can do that. Yeah, okay. yeah. and I, I would add one thing we talk about around the board table at times is how, how do we really tap into the individuals who don't, don't just see the rapid as an option? Um, don't naturally utilize the rapid, even though it may be really close to where they need to go. Uh, and so how do we really get information and better understand those who aren't using the system, why they're not using the system, and then how do we increase ridership and really make it available, more available to everyone, but also just see broader base usage throughout all of our communities. Okay. Yeah. You know, you touched a little bit on the user experience. And another question here for you is, um, during pandemic, just the feeling, how, how do you assure the safety of riders? How can you um, tell maybe somebody that has been hesitant recently about using uh, any of the rapid services that it, it is a, there is a safe way to do this? So rigorous uh, sanitizing and cleaning. Um, you'll see them out um, in between runs. Um, they sanitize the bus. Um, operators are wearing masks. Um, if there's something someone is uncomfortable with and they see something, they should report it to us. Um, we need to know that. Um, customer confidence and the safety and security is you know, kind of our highest priority right now and it's gonna be key to getting ridership back. Um, I hope that they know that one of the things that we would never compromise on is safety. And certainly we understand that COVID and all the variants are scary. Um, our employees have been here through the entire pandemic. They have worked each and every day. Um, they didn't go home, uh, they couldn't work remote. And um, you know we're worried about their safety and health also. Um, so customer confidence and if there are other things they need us to know or wanna let us know that we could possibly be doing, we're open to that. Okay, uh, really appreciate that answer too. We're close to wrapping up, but I wanted to give you one last opportunity. Is there anything you want to tell us about uh, your forward looking uh, for the rapid, what we should watch for, opportunities to maybe uh, hear more about plans, anything like that? So what to watch for is I'm, re I'm really listening. I'm okay. meeting a lot of people. Um, each one of my meetings generates two or three more people to, to speak with. Um, it's been really informative. Um, it shows me how deep and tightly woven the fabric of Grand Rapids is. Um, 
We'll be coming out with kind of like what are the themes I'm hearing, and then our strategic plan. We'll set some measurements in place, and then you know we'll start executing and implementing. And we're not going to get everything right. No one gets it right off the bat, but we're committed to continuing to prove the excellence of our service and value that we deliver to the public. And I think that's really it, our value proposition. How do we tell more people about what it is and what the, what the bus service could, uh, could be to their family? And um, how do we deliver value to those that pay a millage? Okay. Well, Deborah Prado, new CEO of The Rapid, welcome to West Michigan, Grand Thank Rapids you. area. Thank you. I appreciate the time. We'll take a break now, and we'll be back with City Connection in just a few moments. The Rapidian for the community provides an alternative. To be the eyes of somebody who's not there. It's more honest, more authentic, and more true. And you do have the freedom to talk about things because they're things that need to be talked about, not because they'll get readers or viewers or clicks. Sometimes it feels intimidating to write a news story or, or to write a story about a, a community issue. What I love about the Rapidian is that they make it really simple and easy. So it's not like you have to meet this deadline by this time. I'll be eating a sandwich in one hand and then I'm like typing in the other. I love the freedom to be able to write from wherever. I think it's a really powerful experience when people are able to tell their story and to be heard. Anyone can have a voice. Anybody can speak. It's a platform for the community to tell its own story in a very authentic way and that's powerful. The community has to be involved in order for it to be sustainable. And so it tells you something about our community. Welcome back to City Connection, I'm Mayor Rosalind and Bliss and I were uh, very thankful to hear from Deborah Prado with The Rapid. And now we move on to the section where it's uh, community member questions that are just in general in nature and we're going to ask uh, our first one here has to do with uh, definitely that uh, helicopter policing style and here's the question from Kate. It says, Mayor, it says, what situations warrant use of a helicopter being used by police and what protections are place in place to keep it from being used inequitably against minority communities? Yeah. So that, a, a big one there. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question and, and I think that's exactly some of the feedback that we've received this past okay. week and I know the chief as well as our um, OPA director uh, Brandon Davis are looking at that as well as so the city has a couple of things one we do have you know a number of policies in place um, when it comes to helicopters and again this is uh, you know conversations and information I've received from the chief there are times when um, the department the chief believes we do really need assistance from uh, from helicopters or the chief has talked at length about needing and uh, and and the from his perspective, um, the value of drones. So there are times when someone is uh, leaving a, a scene of a crime or in a vehicle and it's dangerous to have high speed pursuits. Um, we find this often with, with motorcycles mm -hmm. uh, where having somebody, a drone or a helicopter, be able to follow that suspect um, is less dangerous than, when, than a high speed chase where someone could get hurt or pedestrians could get hurt or there could it could result in other accidents uh, sometimes even you know so our, our fire department currently uses drones when there's a fire or a critical incident so the chief had said has said consistently actually um, that there are times during critical incidents it's safer to send in 
a drone or have visuals from the sky instead of sending officers into a critical scene. Uh, so there, there are those instances. We are in the process though. We, we have a surveillance policy in place. Uh, you know, a number of folks from the community have asked us to revisit that. That's been in place probably for about five and a half years. We put it in place. I was still a city commissioner at the time. Uh, but we created the surveillance policy with, in partnership with community. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's time to revisit that, particularly as we talk about drones and the chief being pretty adamant that, you know, there needs to be more tools in the toolkit, particularly for high risk or crimes where there's potential mass casualty. So those are, those are conversations that we'll continue to have. I anticipate we'll have them in partnership, as I said, with our OPA office as well as our public safety uh, committee, which is where a lot of those conversations take place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, appreciate that. And then our next question is, what part of the Biden infrastructure bill would benefit, be a benefit to Grand Rapids? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I think it's yet to be determined, quite frankly. There's a lot in that bill. It hasn't been passed yet. Uh, there's a lot of conversations about the different elements within that bill. There's a significant amount of money in that bill that would be targeted towards um, public transit, uh, all types of public transit, not just buses. Uh, so there's some for both rail and other types of transit. There's funding in there dedicated to increase broadband access, which as we know is needed in our community and communities throughout our state. Uh, and so the, the, I think uh, until that package is approved and there's uh, clear eligibility and guidance to communities on how those dollars can be spent, uh, we're speculating how those dollars can be used. Um, there's also some funds in that package, at least currently proposed, that could be used for uh, for electric vehicles. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is something, and to add uh, f uh, electric stations throughout communities. So potentially, if it's uh, my my guess, my assumption is that there will be changes made before the final bill is brought forward and voted on. Uh, but regardless of what ends up in the package. Um, if a significant amount of that money is allocated to infrastructure, I think we'll see a significant amount of money go into local communities for roads, bridges, sidewalks, transit, um, electric charging stations, broadband. Their definition of infrastructure in that package is pretty broad, uh, and I think it would enable us to do, to do quite a bit of investment in infrastructure. Okay. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, federal money and maybe pass-through money, what do we see coming as part of um, COVID-related funds that are being distributed? Yeah, so that, um, so we're still waiting on the final rules coming out of DC on the dollars allocated in this recent relief uh, package for cities. So tentatively, we are expecting roughly $90 million that would come to the city of Grand Rapids. Um, those dollars can be used over the course of roughly four years, so they would have to be spent by December 31st of 2024. Uh, the there's a lot of flexibility in those dollars, but the most important uh, aspect of how those dollars can be used is that they can fill budget deficits. So as of right now, um, this current fiscal year that we're in, which started last July, so it started in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we are currently, the city is currently facing a roughly $20 million deficit. Uh, we expect that that deficit will continue into the next fiscal year. Um, so current projections between uh, the current fiscal year that we're in through 2024, we, we anticipate probably a, a 52 to $60 million deficit. So a good chunk of those dollars we'll be able to use to fill our budget holes. Uh, and then what we're, what, you know, this will be a conversation with the full commission. Obviously, I can't make the decision unilaterally, but my hope is based on uh, dollars that don't go towards stabilizing our city budget, uh, my hope is that we can take a significant portion of those funds and put them in our affordable housing fund, which I know we've talked about mm -hmm. before on the show. Uh, you know, ultimately, I would love to see that fund um, get to about $20 million. Uh, and my hope is that we can identify funds. The, the, the federal dollars are dispersed over two years, so we'll get 50% this year and 50% next year. So my hope is we can take a portion from this year and next year and put it in the affordable housing fund. Um, and then I would also like to see us invest some of those dollars into, into uh, violence prevention, like prevention, mm -hmm. uh, cure violence, uh, the, the employment program we're doing for youth um, between the ages of 15 and 24 called Grow 1000. I would love to beef that up. We're hoping to 
to employ 650 young people this summer. Wow. My hope is that we get to 1,000. That's our ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we create meaningful opportunities for young people um, and, and really have them develop relationships with people in our community and, and really feel connected to community, um, but ultimately just feel like uh, there's there's an opportunity for them in our city uh, so so hopefully we'll we'll have that conversation through the budget process our budget process at the city starts at the end of this month so the city manager will present the budget um, to the city commission I anticipate it'll be a continuing budget so it'll be very similar to next year I don't anticipate that we'll be adding on any significant uh, funding or positions um, I would like to, to see us beef up our behavioral and mental health team, mm -hmm. uh, but again, we have to kind of wait to see where our dollars fall with that. Um, and then we need, to, we need to approve our budget by the end of May for a July 1 start date. So within that time period, hopefully we'll have a sense of how those dollars will be used. Okay. I did see a, an initiative out of the city that maybe is uh, an attempt to find some new revenue and that had to do with maybe naming opportunities for donors in parks and oh, yeah. uh, maybe some other similar sorts of things for uh, marketing and uh, yeah. support. Yeah, so this is interesting. This, um, it's, th so this idea of sponsorship and naming uh, for our parks uh, as well as for uh, buses, so for okay. da our dash or the scooters or if we do e-bikes, uh, this actually dates all the way back to years ago. So back in 2016, I led a Parks Blue Ribbon campaign and we identified 18 opportunities for, for parks to uh, increase revenue or diversify their revenue streams. And sponsorships was one of them. Okay. And uh, it kind of you know fell on the back burner for all this time. And then it got brought back up when we started talking about it for mobility options. Uh, and so we coupled those together. We just passed an updated policy, both for parks and for uh, mobile GR, uh, where we set the guidelines on, on naming, sponsorships, what would that look like, how would it be decided. So we now have that opportunity for folks who make significant donations. Um, so it could be a playground. You know, we get a lot of donations that enable us to build playgrounds throughout the city. Uh, you know, this different splash pads we've used, donations. Um, when we've acquired additional park land, at times we've used uh, donations for that. Uh, so those will now be opportunities for folks. Okay, very interesting uh, concept that seems to have been available and taken advantage of that. Yeah. Um, we're down to uh, last minute or so. Anything final you want to mention? We're uh, in spring break. We'll come out of this. We'll probably meet again on yeah. the first uh, in person, if nothing yeah. changes too drastically, first uh, Monday in May. Yeah. So between now and then. Well, you know, I I, uh, I just want to encourage people to to get the vaccine and to get vaccinated. Sign up. Get in line. Um, I I received my vaccination through the vaccine clinic. It was very easy to navigate. Had a little bit of a sore arm. I was a little tired, but overall, uh, it was fine. And I just really—I know some people have doubts and concerns. I encourage them to talk to their doctor and have a conversation about what their concerns are. Um, it's really essential if we're going to get out of this pandemic that we get to that herd immunity and um, and that we get the vaccination rate up to where we need it to be. Mm -hmm. So, Mary Bliss, glad to hear that you're vaccinated yes. and, and safe and. Uh, we will close out City Connection for this April edition. We'll be back on May 3rd, probably in person, should yes. uh, all things go well. This is City Connection on GRTV Community Media Center's channel. Livewire will broadcast, uh, rebroadcast on Channel 25 throughout the month. I'm Linda Galash with Grand Rapids Community Media Center.